And so this month, we are turning our attention to a new sermon series. And to begin, uh, I want you to think about who or what comes to mind by the term or title evangelist. Evangelist. So when you hear that term, what pops into your head? What images are called forth from the recesses of your memory? Perhaps you see Billy Graham standing at a podium on one of his crusades, standing before thousands in a packed arena while pointing at the word of God, proclaiming the gospel. Or you see a preacher, whether Ben or myself or someone else who's been instrumental in your faith, standing before a humble congregation, bringing the good word accompanied by puns uh, or memes or Lord of the Rings references. (laughs) Does your mind wander afar? Do you connect the title evangelist with, with here? here referring to CFLM or Mainville, uh, or to your own domicile, or does it belong on a horse farm with the Bowers? Does it belong overseas with Denver and Zimbabwe, or with the Dye family advancing God's kingdom, kingdom in Venezuela, or just right there? And so maybe you envision all these televangelists you'd like to disassociate from. Kenneth Copeland with his demonic grin and haunting eyes, Uh, Joel Osteen holding up his Bible before thousands at the start of every sermon only to put it down and largely ignore it. Benny Hinn cheating the desperate out of money all the while promising healing. Or Creflo Dollar who once asked his congregation to buy him a private jet for $60 million. I just want a whiteboard. And so... (laughs) These are, these are men who have slandered the name of Jesus and who make you weary of being connected to the term evangelical. Or do you think of the man on the street corner with a sign reading, Repent and Believe, and a megaphone reading or screaming scripture? Those who have spent time on a college campus may call to, mi- call to mind those who preach hellfire and brimstone, likely making you a little uncomfortable. You know it's likely that some are going to ask you about him because they know you're a Christian, and even though you mostly agree with the guy, you wish he had a bit more tact. Many more may come to mind, ranging from faithful to faithless, from humble to haughty. Whoever came to mind for you, I can tell you one person who probably didn't, you. Uh, When I said the term evangelist, I doubt any of you thought of the person that you see when you look in the mirror. And so I have to wonder, why is that? Why is it we we do not associate ourselves with this title evangelist? Now, after three weeks in Thessalonica, Paul and Silas had to flee the city, leaving by cover of night. They went west some 45 miles to a small town, Berea. Luke records this leg of their journey in Acts 17. So we're going to bounce around between Mark 6 and Acts 17 this morning. Um, And so let me read this as it sets the stage for some of where we're going as we see that Paul made his way from Thessalonica to Athens, and so too shall we. So Acts 17, 10 to 14. The brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. That's a very biblical insult if you've ever been looking for one. Oh, they're they're more noble-minded. Uh, For they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, along with a number of prominent Greek women and men. But when the Jews of Thessalonica found out that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul and Berea also, they came there as well, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul out to go as far as the sea, and Silas and Timothy remained there. And so Paul, as we mentioned, went from Thessalonica to Athens, and that's what we're doing too. So thus far in our study of discipleship this year, we've really been trying to establish deep roots. We took time to look at Jesus the rabbi. We we spent some time considering the cost of discipleship through self-denial and obedience to Christ's commands. Uh, You may not remember this, or you may not believe this, but it was this year that we spent three months going through celebration of discipline uh, and the spiritual disciplines attached to that in order to cultivate the gardens of our lives through spiritual disciplines. We've considered the example of the early church, specifically the church at Thessalonica, to see what discipleship looks like on a day-to-day basis. In other words, we've spent the last eight months or so tending the soil, But as any gardener would tell you, soil isn't prepared for its own sake, but for the sake of the gardener, that it would be fruitful and productive. 
And so with the soil of our hearts prepared, over the next couple of months, we're going to turn our attention to Christ's commands to go and do, to share our faith, to evangelize. And so this month, we'll look at some practical principles, and then as the leaves change colors and we make our way into October, we'll contend with some of the major questions we can ask and anticipate when talking about the hope that we have in Christ. And along the way, I pray that we'll see evangelists each time we look in the mirror, for all disciples have been commanded to go and do. And so before we join Paul in Athens, let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we give you praise for this day. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to to gather with those whom we love, friends and family, uh, those who have been called by you and set free from the bondage of sin. Lord, we thank you so much that we can call ourselves children of God. Uh, Lord, how incredible that is, that that is who we are because of what your son has done. And so, Lord, as, as we gather, let it be to your glory. Let us do so with joy and with thanksgiving in our hearts. Lord, we love you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. So our home sits at the end of a cul-de-sac along a tree line that separates us from a retirement community. And when we bought our home, we wanted to be like the hub, the the hangout for friends and neighborhood kids. And we set up a basketball hoop, which has successfully lured away a few young men long enough to stop playing video games to actually attempt to throw the sphere. Um, And over the years, a core group of neighborhood kids have gathered at our home to climb trees, to fall off trees, to to giggle at chickens, to negotiate Pokemon trades, to take up a a bat for impromptu home run derbies, to run around and play tag, and to partake in one of my personal favorites to behold, hide and seek. Uh, If you've never watched children play hide and seek, you are missing out. Uh, One of the reasons is because every child interprets counting to 10 differently. Now, some uh, count very graciously, and and they give you all the time in the world to hide. Others are able to break the space-time continuum, and and somehow they get to 25 within eight seconds. It's amazing. Uh, But the universal cry of all children in said circumstances is, ready or not? Yes, it is a familiar phrase. And so when I've talked to people about sharing their faith, I found that many would say they are not ready. And and I've spent years in youth ministry, I've spent years working with adults, and it doesn't matter. Uh, It doesn't matter if you're 12 or 80. Uh, Most would say, yeah, I I do not feel ready. I do not feel equipped. I do not feel like I am confident enough to share my faith. And so I've found that really all of the excuses and all the reasons I've ever been given are rooted in fear. Fear of the unknown, fear of looking stupid if you're asked a question that you can't answer, Fear of harming a friendship or being confrontational. Fear of losing a job or being treated differently in the workplace. Fear of being in an awkward, uncomfortable situation. Fear of rejection. And really, in most cases, when I hear all this, it's ultimately a fear of man rather than a fear of God. It's a fear of man rather than a fear of God. Now, last Sunday before church, I was reading through John 12. And this is a bit of a rabbit trail, but it's a relevant rabbit trail. Those are the best kind. And so Jesus has entered Jerusalem and told his disciples he must soon be lifted up. Crowds had heard a voice from heaven accompanying Jesus' teachings. And then comes verses 42 and 43. These verses have kind of been weighing on me over the last week in preparation for this sermon. And so I, I pray that they weigh on you too. And so in John 12, 42 to 43, we see this. Nevertheless, many even of the rulers believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him, for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. And so what startled me is that you can have a true belief in Jesus, and you can still love the approval of men rather than the approval of God. You can have both of those things at the same time. And that really startled me, because I'd like to think, oh, if if I'm have a faith in Jesus, that must certainly mean that I I want to, or that I fear him and not man. But no, that's not the case at all. And so whenever I have the opportunity to teach on or reflect upon the command to go, to, to share our faith, I have to ask myself, am I guilty of this? Am I guilty of loving the approval of man rather than God? Or more accurately, how often am I guilty of this? 
Now, I fondly remember the interview I had with the elders before I came on staff with CFLM. I, I do not remember uh, precisely what prompted it. I think I was saying something to Pete Overbaker, but I said something to the effect of, I am not an evangelist. Um, and, and so, in other words, evangelism doesn't come naturally to me at least evangelism as I usually think about it. Now, I've found that some people just have this knack for, for weaving the things of God, for weaving Jesus into like any conversation. Some, some of the people that immediately came to mind as I, was, as I was preparing this were like Steve Walker, Sharon Pearson, Billy Ballard, my wife. People were suddenly, before you know it, you're, you're talking about, I don't know, sports. Uh, and then suddenly it's like, oh, we're, we're talking about the Bible now. Uh, and, and the whole thing has just been shifted. And some people are very, very good at this. I'm a pastor. I'm terrible at that. Um, I am just, it just not, does not come naturally to me. It, it is not something that um, is just what I do. Um, I am more the kind that tends to overthink things. I'm the kind of person who's sitting there, I think of like 87 different things that I ought to say, and then as a result, I say nothing. Um, and so I, I have plenty of eloquent excuses. I have all the words. But as much as I hate to confess it, I often fear man rather than God. And I share that because I suspect others struggle with that too. Um, and, and so as we want to get into this subject of, of evangelism, I just wanted to, to start with this, this idea of repentance. Uh, because I think we must recognize that when it comes to evangelism, a repentant heart is a ready heart. And a ready heart is a repentant heart. We, we have all the, these pictures of, of what it looks like to be ready, of what it means to be qualified, of, of how much we need to know. And scripturally, really, the foundation, the qualification for sharing the good news is repentance, is having a repentant heart that says, hey, I believe in Christ. I believe he has rescued me from sin, and let me tell you about that. That's the foundation. And so remember, to repent means what? To change your mind. And so when it comes to evangelism, many of us need to change our minds about whose approval we truly desire. And so I know we've already prayed, but guess what? You can pray more than once in a sermon. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and just pause and just have a, have a time of prayer just to set our hearts as we turn our attention to evangelism. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would transform us from the inside out. Oh, God, who sees our hearts, we thank you. We thank you that you have given us the Holy Spirit who is with us always. We thank you that you have, that you have overcome the world and that he who has overcome the world is with us and in us. And so we pray that as we turn our attention to, to sharing this good news, uh, that we would do so with joy and excitement and without the kind of paralyzing fear that often takes over. And so, Lord, we, we place our trust in you. Oh, Lord, we love you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. And so before we join Paul in Athens, we're going to uh, define some terms and consider what it means to be qualified to evangelize according to the scriptures. Now, it may surprise you to know the term evangelize or evangelism doesn't show up in really any of the translations that you read, NASB, ESV, NIV, even the good old faithful King James. Uh, you're not going to find it in there. And so where do we get this term evangelize? Well, ultimately, there's this Greek word hiding behind two terms that we use a whole lot. And so I'm going to read it, and I think you're going to be able to translate it. You, you don't know it, but you know Greek today. And so we're in Mark 1.15, just briefly, and the verse says, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Therefore, repent and believe the, the gospel, the gospel, the gospel. I heard, like, two people very, very, you know, timidly whisper that. It's, it's, it's church. Like, you're allowed to talk about the gospel here and not be scared. Uh, and so repent and believe in the gospel. Um, and so we see at the heart of the gospel is this term, euangelio. Uh, everyone say, euangelio. Very good. Uh, and so even though we don't really see the term evangelism in any of our translations, we see this root term uh, from which we get the term gospel or good news. So at the heart of the gospel is good news, is this euangelio. Now a second term. Uh, and so a second word that we see a lot. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Now I make known to you, brethren, the euangelion or the euangelio, which was what? The gospel. And so I make known to you the gospel, which I euangelis amen to you, which also you received, in which also you stand. What do we think that word is? 
Breached. Nailed it, Jeff. Always 10 out of 10, Jeff. And so, yes, uh, this, this could quite literally be translated. And now I make known to you the gospel, which I gospeled to you. Um, and, and so we see that at the heart of, of evangelism, when it comes to this term, we see in one form, we see the message itself. And on the other, in the other form, we see the, the act of proclaiming the message, right? And so you can either take this good news out or you ha- can, can do it. You can preach it. You can proclaim it. And so we see at the heart of all of this, at the heart of evangelism, is the gospel. Now, in Jesus' day, a euangelion wasn't just any announcement. This is pretty interesting. It was a royal announcement. So say that Caesar has decided that, hey, my birthday is coming up, and I think I want to bless my entire empire with a party. Uh, a party in which I'm going to send out a euangelion. That is a royal announcement, a royal decree that it is my birthday. And as a result, they have the, the blessing, they have the privilege to send me gifts. Um, and, and so that's the kind of idea uh, that was in place in Jesus' day around the term euangelion. And so to, to try to put yourself in, in the sandals of what it would, been, would have been like for them, consider the gut reaction you have Uh, When you hear that the White House has an official announcement, a statement, a press release for the public, uh, it doesn't really matter who sits in the Oval Office. You're probably not going to be too encouraged uh, or enamored by what it is they have to say. Uh, You're probably wondering, okay, I wonder uh, how they're going to tax us for air this time. Um, And and so you, you already have this skepticism. If, if, If you hear that and you, you think, ugh, now, now you understand to a degree what they would have thought when they heard this term euangelion. It wasn't good news. It was, it was nonsense. It was hollow news. Uh, it, was, it was a facade. It claimed to be good when it was fake and hollow. And so what's really, really interesting and really, really awesome is that Jesus took this word about a royal decree and he applied it to himself. And so Jesus was making it very clear. There is a new king in town. And unlike their hollow decrees, he brings news that is actually good. And so to evangelize then is to announce the good news of Jesus to a sinful, jaded, and hopeless world. And so before we join Paul in Athens, we have one last pit stop in Nazareth. You can go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 6. We're going to spend a little bit of time there. Then we'll make our way over to Acts 17, and then we will go and do. And so there, quote, we see just some of the context leading up to it in verses 5 and 6. There, quote, Jesus could do no miracle except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. That is, that's kind of a hilarious phrase uh, in the sense that, you know, just imagine Jesus like, ah, oh, I could just heal a few. Uh, it's just so, so bizarre uh, to see that kind of phrase in Scripture. Now, those verses deserve their own sermon, so we'll just let them set the stage for now. And so as I read through verses 7 through 13, what I want you to pay attention to, what I want you to consider, is when is someone ready to evangelize? When is someone qualified to announce the good news of Jesus? And so we start off in verse 7 of Mark 6, making our way through verse 13. And then we'll look at some of the specifics as they pertain to us. And he summoned the twelve and began to send them out in pairs and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. And he instructed them that they should take nothing for their journey except a mere staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belt, but to wear sandals. And he added, do not put on two tunics. And he said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave. Any place that does not receive you or listen to you as you go out from there, shake the dust off the soles of your feet for a testimony against them. They went out and preached that men should repent. And they were casting out many demons and were anointing with oil many sick people and healing them. Now, as we think about the fact that Jesus sent these people out, let's consider briefly what it is they knew at this point in their ministry. This is very early on in Jesus's ministry. And so if we look exclusively at the gospel of Mark from which we see this passage, uh, we can see that the disciples had seen and heard by way of teaching uh, that Jesus, well, they watched as Jesus confronted the Pharisees telling them that all sin shall be forgiven, um, shall be forgiven except for blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. 
They had seen Jesus with his family in, in what was no doubt a very awkward family experience in which Jesus is saying, oh yeah, my mother and brothers and sisters are outside. Well, no, 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 my mother and brothers and sisters are right here. Uh, and, and so you can imagine the disciples watching this felt a little uncomfortable with this uh, family dispute. Furthermore, Jesus had taught them a few parables, such as the parable of the sower and the mustard seed. They watched Jesus rebuke, rebuke both the wind, stilling the sea, and a demon, stilling the soul. Lastly, they accompanied Jesus as he healed a woman of a 12-year hemorrhage and raised a synagogue official's daughter to life, who, interestingly enough, was 12 years old. And so when Jesus sent them out in pairs, do you think they thought they were ready? Do you think they thought they were qualified and that they, that they had all the answers? Well, if we look at the way that the disciples just blunder their way through the rest of Jesus' ministry, obviously not. Uh, they were not ready. They, they did not know that what they were doing. Ha half the time, they're, they're just saying the silliest of things. Shall I rain down fire upon them, Lord? Ah, slow down. Um, and, and so we see that's not quite, they didn't quite have it all, all together. Uh, I suspect they had as much confidence as a cat next to a cucumber. Uh, as if you've ever seen that. I've given you something to YouTube later. And so the disciples, they had seen much, but they didn't know much. More important than what they knew was who they knew. They might have lacked confidence in themselves, but they had all the trust in the world in Christ, even if it was only the, the size, that trust is only the size of a mustard seed. And their faith has since moved mountains, has it not? And so reflecting on whether we're ready or not, let's highlight some of the details of the disciples' journey as they relate to us. And so first off, we see that they were sent out in pairs. They were sent out in pairs. Why, why do that? Uh, why would Jesus send them out in pairs? After all, if he, if he divided them up and sent them out solo, he would have been able to cover twice as much ground. Um, and, and so we see right from the beginning, covering ground wasn't the goal of what Jesus is doing here. We see the best evangelism, the most effective witnessing, it isn't done alone. It isn't done without support. And so when in pairs, we're accountable to one another. When things are going well and our pride is swelling up like a balloon, our, our friend can, can pop it and tell us, hey, calm down, uh, you're getting big-headed. Or when we're having door after door after door slammed in our face, we can laugh with our friend about who, who do we think slammed the door the hardest. Um, and, and so we, we can have those kind of encouraging, uplifting conversations, but we can also uh, kind of pull each other down if we notice that uh, pride is starting to grow up in our hearts. And so when the disciples were sent out, they didn't just spend time witnessing, they spent time with one another. And I think that's a very underrated aspect of discipleship and of it, and evangelism, is the fact that you are with other people who are committed to this process. Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. And so the best witnessing comes from strong relationships of those closely following Christ. And so even if you're not knocking on doors in pairs, it's wise to have close friends with whom you can share the conversations and encounters you have. After all, you may find yourself at work and you have a difficult conversation and you're not really sure how to proceed or follow up. It's so valuable to be able to call somebody, even in the congregation, and say, hey, I got this question and I'm lost. What do you think? And so that kind of relationship becomes a foundation, a catalyst uh, for, for taking the good news out. Secondly, we see, and this is one of those overlooked things, details where we just glossed it over like, of course it is. Uh, secondly, we see their authority came from Jesus. Their authority came from Jesus. And so when sharing the good news, it is critical to keep ourselves in proper perspective. You are, on your best day, a messenger. You're a mailman. Um, and so it's not a mess your message that you're sharing, but it's Christ's. We are sharing Jesus's message by Jesus's authority. And so when the disciples went out, they knew they would one day return and give a report to the rabbi who had sent them out. They were to account for how they handled themselves, if they honored the conditions set forth by the rabbi to celebrate successes and to repent of failures. That same truth is true today. And so we will return to Jesus and give an account for what we did and what we did not do at the time and opportunities that God has given us. And so we're going to give an account for every time we were left awestruck and dumbfounded by the fact that God worked through us. But we're also going to have to give an account for every single time we ignored or overlooked someone because we were simply too busy. And so the disciples were then instructed to take nothing with them except the clothes on their backs. 
I think most of us fail that every day coming to church. And so these instructions, though, were to highlight urgency and trust. Urgency and trust. They were to go out quickly, not idling, wondering which pair of shoes to wear, or which shirt would make the best first impression. Jesus effectively says, all your excuses are really, really lame. Uh, they're really, really bad. All the reasons that you think you have for not taking the good news out, that is a bad excuse. That is a bad reason. And so Jesus was right from the beginning eliminating every possible excuse they could make for why they should delay or put it off. And so furthermore, they were to trust. Not, not only were they to pack lightly so that they didn't idle, but they packed lightly because they were to trust that God would provide everything along the way. Well, how would God provide? We see that in the very next verse, verse 10. They were told to stay in the first house that welcomes you. Why do you suppose that was the instruction? Why would Jesus tell them, hey, uh, whatever first house welcomes you, stay there? Well, think about it this way. Imagine I'm new to Mainville, and I show up, and I come to Mainville with very good news. And not only do I come with very good news, but I come with some like healing power. Um, and so as I show up, one, one family decides, oh, yes, come and stay here, and we will feed you and shelter you and take care of you. But then the longer I stay there, a more wealthy family comes along and says, hey, we see what you did for them. We'd like you to do that for us. Come, come and stay in our home. And so it could be very easy for the disciples to use this as a way of climbing the social ladder. It would be very easy to say, hey, even though I'm going to start with the lowly, I'm going to let this be an opportunity to rise through the social ranks. And so Jesus is essentially telling them, you are not going to use the gospel for personal gain. You are not going to use this good news to take advantage of other people. And so they were to stay in the first house that welcomed them, rich or poor, impartiality fully on display, which really is the application for us. And so in our own sharing, we're to be completely impartial, avoiding any personal gain that may come, uh, sharing the good news to those who look like they've got it all together, as well as those in stained Ford overalls. Uh, that's, that's how we're supposed to do it. Yes, that was a knock on Steve Walker, but he's not here. I was going to say those who have it together or, or Steve, because there's like eight Steves in the congregation, and, and then I would have shamed you, uh, because you would have had a Steve in your head, which would have incriminated you. But I didn't do that to you. Let me continue. I've, I've gone off track. So we see furthermore that if they are rejected, they are to shake the dust off their feet as a testimony against them. Um, and so, in shaking off the dust of their feet, we see that, I don't know if you noticed this, in the New Testament, we see humans, we see people doing what angels formerly did. Angels would go out in the Old Testament, they would scope out a city, and they would determine whether or not it was a city deserving of God's wrath. God is entrusting us with that kind of power. And so to shake off the dust of one's sandal was to declare a place worthy of God's wrath. It was a way of saying, I am taking nothing of this place with me. It's worthy of destruction. Now, it's worth noting that this kind of condemnation in Scripture is made against communities. It's made against cities, not individuals. Uh, we don't really see any examples of Scripture of anybody taking off their sandals and shaking anybody's face. Uh, it's more of a way of condemning a particular community that has rejected the good news of the gospel. And so, as we think about this, we might wonder, well, exactly how does that apply today? Like, in what way do we do that? Like, I, I can't imagine any of you in your workplace just taking off your shoe and, you know, waving at anybody. And, and so what does this mean? Well, I think Matthew 7, 6 provides us some insight. Matthew 7, 6 says, Do not give what is holy to dogs, and do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Some harsh stuff. And so when it comes to making disciples, frankly, you just move with those who move. You move with those who move. Suppose you're on a four-lane road, and three lanes are moving smoothly, uh, but one has been at a standstill for hours. Uh, there might be some times where it's relevant to stay in that lane that will not move, but usually the wisest course of action is to go in the other lanes uh, and to move in the lanes that are actually moving. And so what is true about driving in that situation is also true of discipleship and evangelism. If you are stubbornly trying to work with somebody who just refuses to listen to anything you say, 
well, it may be time to move with those who move. Um, that doesn't mean that you simply say that you no longer wish to have a relationship or that you no longer care about that individual. It simply means that for a time we step away because our efforts are not being received and our role in their lives was to plant the seeds while trusting that God is going to provide the increase with somebody else later. Lastly, look at what the disciples did. And this is where I think we look at a story like this and we're like, this doesn't relate to us. After all, we see that they preached repentance. Yeah, you can do that. They cast out demons and they healed the sick. Uh, now we hear that. And, and I think many of us feel like we are ill-equipped. We do not have that kind of power within us. We are wrong. Uh, and, and so... What we find is, you know, we may go out and we might be asked to, to pray over those who are hurting or sick, uh, but we don't necessarily feel like we have the power to do all this stuff. Now, regardless of your views about the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit is active today, I am really convinced that every single Christian is a sign. Uh, every single Christian is a sign of a changed life to other people. And so you are a sign of the truthfulness and the message. And so, for example, for them... They were casting out demons, and perhaps you can still, still not do that today. You can debate that later. Uh, but ultimately, what we see here is that you are the sign. When you come before somebody and they see your transformed life, a life transformed from the inside out, you are the sign that they look at and say, huh, maybe there is some truthfulness to what, what this message has to say. Your changed life is the sign. I learned a very long time ago that the world does not read the Bible. The world reads you. Uh, the world reads us. And, and so the world isn't going to open up to, to John 3.16 and say, oh, fair enough. I, I see. I repent. No. Uh, they are going to look at you who professes to know John 3.16 and evaluate whether or not they should even consider it based on your life. You are what they're reading. And, and so I encourage you, when they're reading you, what is it they're seeing? Do they see somebody who has been transformed from the inside out, who has been made new, who once was this but now is made new? Or do they see someone who is just like them, who just happens to have a little bit of a schedule conflict on Sunday mornings? And so that's what you have to consider. Are you that kind of person, or have you, have you been changed from the inside out? And so in thinking about this, when the disciples were sent out, what were they responsible for? What were they truly responsible for? They were responsible for witnessing, not converting. You cannot convert a single person. Try all you want. You're going to fail. At best, you're going to tell them the truth, and that truth is going to rise up within them, and the Lord's going to work that into their hearts and bring it forth. You're not converting. And, and so when it comes to evangelism, we are witnesses, not salesmen. Evangelism isn't a matter of winning and losing. It's a matter of faithfulness versus faithlessness. Either you believe Jesus is who he says he is, and you faithfully witness to that, or you don't. And so when you interact with someone and you're talking about Jesus or other issues of faith, repent of that mindset that you need to close the deal or win the argument. And so we are responsible to faithfully witness. That's it. That is evangelism, is faithfully telling the truth about what Jesus has done for us. You don't have to have all these loaded answers. You can simply say, hey, this is what Jesus has done in my life. Congratulations, you're an evangelist now. And so you are the one who has been called to the stand, and it's, it's your honor and duty to testify to what you've seen and heard, which brings us to Paul. And so go ahead, and, and if you haven't already, you can turn to Acts 17. That's where we're going to be spending the rest of our time this almost afternoon. And so we don't know how long Paul is in Berea, but the account is brief. Concerned for his safety, Paul is escorted to Athens without any of his usual friends, Luke, Timothy, Silas, and others, uh, have all kind of been left behind or scattered abroad. And instead of waiting for his companions, Paul went and found the town synagogue as well as the Areopagus. Now, Paul was proclaiming the gospel. He was gospeling the gospel uh, to any who would hear, whether Jew or Gentile. And we see that while, while it's recommended to preach in pairs, it's not required. Now, we, we kind of use the terms Areopagus and Marcel interchangeably. One, one summary of the area describes it this way. Northwest of the city of Athens, Greece, is a small hill covered in stone seats. This area was once used as a forum for the rulers of Athens to hold trials, to debate, and discuss important matters. 
This location was called Areopagus, a combination of the Greek words for god of war and stone. The Areopagus is literally Ares rock. The equivalent to Ares in Roman mythology is Mars, and so by the time of Paul in the early Christian church, this location was under Roman control, hence Mars Hill. And so we pick up in Acts 17, 16. There's a whole lot going on here, and so keep in mind we'll be looking for what we can take away concerning evangelism. Verses 16 and 17 of chapter 17. Now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. And so in modern terms, Paul was triggered. Uh, he was provoked from within. Uh, he was angry, and yet we see in spite of his anger, in spite of his provocation, uh, he was still completely under control and, and composed. Um, and, and so it's, it's a very interesting description here. And so in spite of all the beautiful architect architecture and the beautiful scenery, he knew he was surrounded by people who were lost. And so did you notice where Paul went, though? He was actively pursuing opportunities. He went where the people were. He didn't sit at home and, and stare at a wall and wonder, you know, why, why can't I talk to anybody about Jesus? Uh, well, I think I can tell you why. Um, and so he went where religious conversations were to be expected. In the synagogues, Paul could, could build off of, of the Old Testament and tell them about how Jesus had fulfilled various types and prophecies. Uh, he also went to the marketplace where he could interact with, with the Greeks and tell them about the, the God who, who raises the dead. And so likewise, we have to go where the people are. Now, back in February, I went on a cruise with several families from this church. And at our last stop, uh, Andy and Jackie Sabalski, as well as Kristen and I, were zipping around on golf carts in Bimini, this, this tiny little island in the Bahamas, which is the standard way to travel on this seven-mile island. Uh, and, and so as we're zipping around, we're trying to look for these, these little trinkets and souvenirs for our kids. And, and as we make our way to this little area, Kristen and I kind of hear this gospel music playing in the background. So we're like, oh, what is that? What's that? And so we make our way over to it. And, and Kristen, in her typical blunt f fashion, uh, asked this man, do you love Jesus? Uh, and, and the reason she asked him is part, part, in part because he had various religious trinkets in front of him, like, I love Jesus bracelet. Like, she's like, do you? And, and at which point, man, we got a sermon. Uh, and, and so this guy's like, oh, yeah, I love Jesus. In fact, I'm a pastor in this area. And, and I noticed as I, was, as I was preaching here, nobody was coming to my church. And so I thought, hey, how do I, go, how do I get more people? Well, I got to go to the people. Jesus went to the highways and the byways, so I have to go to the highways and byways. And he, he gave me a beautiful sermon. And like this whole crew of people starts surrounding. And I'm like, absolutely, sir. I don't want to miss my cruise, but that is true. And, and so I, I set the stage for him. Uh, and so he was preaching. I made my way out. It was glorious. Uh, but ultimately what we see is we have to go to where the people are. Uh, we have to go. Uh, we have been so blessed as a church over the last few years that family after incredible family capable of leading has been brought to this church, but we can't stay content with that. Uh, we have to say, Lord, thank you for providing a strong foundation. Let us be faithful to build. Um, and, and so with that, with recognizing the foundation that really God is laying here, it's, it's kind of time to turn our attention and go. And so with that, we got to consider, what does Paul do with the anger that has been stirred up within him? Well, we go to verse 18. It says, And also some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with him. Some were saying, What would this idle babbler wish to say? Others, He seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities, because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. So we want to know what these things mean. Now the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. And you thought the scripture wasn't relatable. And so Paul is taken from the Agora, that is the marketplace, to the Areopagus, the court. 
Now, just as in the same way that today we can refer to a Congress as both a place and a people, so they could refer to the Areopagus as both a place and a people. In this case, people with vastly contrasting views who came together to debate and amuse one another with something new, namely the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. Now, just to kind of be introduced to some various aspects of their beliefs, as it's going to be helpful later, uh, to quote one summary of Epicurean thought, they write, quote, Epicurus's goal was to teach people to relax and enjoy life without worrying so much. Um, his first step was to remove the idea of the gods from the psyche of his followers. To Epicurus, the, go Epicurus, excuse me, the gods did exist, but they lived so far away from the affairs of man in a permanent state of ataraxia, or peace, that they didn't interfere with humanity. In fact, the gods don't even know you exist. And so with the removal of fear of the gods came two advantages for the Epicureans. First, there's no judgment after death. And so you don't have to fear it. You know, YOLO. Everything is material, and so whatever soul there is, it's connected to the physical body and ceases to exist upon death. Secondly, there is no judgment during life. You know, if God doesn't even know you exist, how are you going to be accountable to him? And so we hear all of that, and, and we find that it's still very relevant today. Uh, for instance, many, many people today believe there's a God who ultimately wants you to be happy to whom you don't have to be accountable. Uh, that is probably the, the prevailing theology of America. Uh, and, and so recognizing that, we recognize that even though there's all these old ancient uh, philosophy terms, this is today. Uh, and so this is still very much on display now. By contrast, we have Stoicism. It's not quite the opposite of Epicureanism, but they, they diverge on many a point. Now, a, cr a critique of Stoicism observes, quote, and so they kind of hinge around this idea of logos. For them, logos is natural order uh, or natural law. That's going to be important for this definition. It writes, one area in which Stoicism contradicts Christianity is in the physics. The entire Stoic god is wrong. Stoicism teaches a kind of pantheism. That is not the worship of pants. Uh, it is the belief that God is everything and in everything. This, this is God from this kind of mindset. Um, and so that God is not only Logos, but Logos is God. And, the, and so the reason that, that uh, Logos reigns in the cosmos is that it is in everything and a part of everything. And Sto Stoics then emphasize reason and rationalism and logic. The philosophy aims to align one's expectations with the Logos and to, let, and to not worry about the rest. And so as one grows in understanding of the natural law and the universe, uh, they will mature and be less bound by the emotions. All of that's to say, um, if, if perhaps you've ever described someone as stoic, you're probably describing them as stoic because they seem to have a, a bland countenance. Uh, they, they show no emotions on their face, and that kind of derives from the sense of trying to take control of, of the emotional. And so the spiritually blind and impoverished have a knack for condemning others for doing precisely what they are doing. Uh, the Pharisees attributed Jesus' ministry to Satan and when it, was, when it was they who were children of the devil. Our world likewise spews forth venomous hatred and judgment all the while proclaiming love and tolerance. And so Paul's world was no different. As these idle babblers accused Paul of, of rambling on, we see that it was they who were the idle babblers. The blind, after all, cannot see the logs in their own eyes. And so our world hungers for the next big thing, the next new thing. People stand in line for hours, staring at their fully functional devices, uh, only to upgrade one handheld computer for another. Uh, entire industries, like Goodwill, thrive off the fact that we have too much and we don't even need to sell it. And so what we do with stuff, those debating at Mars Hill were doing with ideas. You know, we are constantly exchanging useful things for newer things, even though we don't really need them. And likewise, they were doing that with ideas. And so Paul has arrived with what they believe to be new foreign gods, if you notice that. They're like, oh, is Jesus a god? Is resurrection god? They were very confused by what it is Paul had to say, which is then where Paul takes his stand, and this is where things get really awesome. So if you've been a little tired and you're reel it in, we're almost there. It's about to get really cool. For, especially for history buffs like me. So Acts 17, 22 to 23. So Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. 
For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. Now, some scholars and theologians have actually criticized Paul's tactics here, saying that he seems to have compromised the gospel, or that maybe he's um, you know, bent the knee to the, to the culture a little bit too much. He's trying too hard to be relevant. He's leaning into to their beliefs and their idols. And those who are accusing Paul of pandering really don't know the history, because the history is awesome. And so over 600 years before Paul's arrival at Athens, there was a terrible Ebola-like plague that hit the area. Uh, people were like bleeding out of every pore and having this slow, awful death. And so they're withering away. One third of the city died, and the rest were threatened as the plague lingered on for months. The city that was religious in every respect cried out to their idols. They flogged and beat themselves like the prophets of Baal, but silence, none of them delivered. And so the plague raged on. And so at the time, a famous philosopher and poet, Epimenides the Cretan, was in the area. This is the same Cretan who is quoted by Titus, by, quoted in Titus's letter uh, from Paul. And so he was residing in the city. And so after trying unsuccessfully to make sacrifices to the local gods, Epimenides has a dream. And in the dream, he was told that when you awake, there's going to be a flock of sheep in the Agora, in the marketplace. And so from Mars Hill, they could see the marketplace. And so there'd be all these idols on display. And so Epimenides is told, when you awake, in the midst of all these idols, there's going to be a flock of sheep. And so when you awake, follow that flock of sheep. And when you follow them, they're eventually going to stop. And when they stop, take one of the lambs, build an altar, and sacrifice, uh, make a sacrifice, and, and ultimately that um, the, the plague will be abated. And so desperate, the next morning, Epimenides awakes, and behold, he sees the flock of sheep in the Agora, and he follows them. And just as the dream instructed, he builds an altar, sacrifices a lamb, and within two days, the plague is ended. This was the unknown God. And so the God who provided a sheep to lead them, a God who restored those who were as good as dead to life within three days of offering a lamb. They had no name to ascribe to this God. They simply knew that when all of their gods had failed, this go other God came out of nowhere, led them by a lamb, and saved them. Does that sound familiar to you? And so we, we hear all that, and we see, so we see that at Mars Hill, Paul didn't bow to the culture. Rather, he showed a deep knowledge of their history and traditions and saw the hand of God had gone before him to prepare a way and to prepare the to prepare hearts that they would be without excuse. And so what they worshipped in ignorance, Paul made known to them. The God who rescued the city by means of a lamb had returned to claim what was his. And so I forgot to make a slide for this, but I wanted to finish reading this section of, of Acts 17 before we turn to some final conclusions. And so as we do this, think about the different ways that Paul's interacting with the philosophies we've heard about, how he's interacting with Epicureanism, how he's interacting with Stoicism. Verse 24 of chapter 17, the God who made the world and all the things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives all people life and breath and all things, you silly Stoics. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each of us, you silly Epicureans. For in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said, for we also are his children. Being then the children of God, we ought not think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead." And so as we think about some, some practical applications for us as to what this means for evangelism, first and foremost, we see that God goes before us. God goes before us. This is established in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 31.8. 
The Lord is the one who goes ahead of you. He will be with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Or Isaiah 45, 2. I will go before you and make the rough places smooth. I will shatter the doors of bronze and cut through their iron bars. And so there is not a person or place in the world where God hasn't already been preparing the way. And so God is working in the hearts and lives of others even when we don't see it. Now, did Paul have tremendous success while preaching to Athens? No. Uh, for the most part, it looks like most scoffed at what he had to say and very few came to belief. Uh, the fact of the matter is, though, his faithfulness then has resulted in the faithfulness of millions through the generations. And so we see the truth of the matter is you are, you are going to be long dead before most of the fruit of your faithfulness is really on display. Oh, well, wonderful. How great it is that God is going to use those things even after we're gone. We see that many missionaries are called to unreached people, and they're like the front line of soldiers in war. Their deaths pay, pay, have paved a way for those who come next. And so at times, you're going to be paving the way. At other times, you're going to show up, and you're going to find that God has already sent someone before you to prepare the way. Secondly, know your audience. Uh, Paul was able to speak into the Athenian culture in a way that few others could because he knew their philosophers and their stories. He wasn't afraid of getting to know pagan culture because he recognized that he could work from there to lead people to a point of belief. And so as you recognize the people or communities upon whom God has placed a burden on your heart, make every effort to get to know them. Get to know their core beliefs. Come to understand the stories that guide or shape their thinking. Along the way, pray that God would give you wisdom and insight into, and, into understanding how you can speak into the hearts of others in a powerful and meaningful way, just as we saw Paul do with the unknown God. And thirdly, seek a connection. Now, in a place where many gods were worshipped and where people had very different ideas about who God is, Paul started by finding one area of connection. Uh, they each shared a passion for the religious. And instead of using their paganism as a boundary, we see that Paul uses their desire for truth as a point of similarity to invite the, the, the audience into listening. He took the time to research their history so he could connect God's work in the past to his saving work in the present. Now, connections are going to change based on the audience. Start small and look for a connection with people, whether it's sports or music or art. Um, show people you care about them, um, and, and you'll be shocked by what may come. Just think about Think about it this way. We often, as Christians, struggle uh, with things like loneliness and despair, and we have the Holy Spirit in us. Uh, and, and so if we feel that way, how much must the world feel that way when they do not have the Holy Spirit? Now, some time ago, Stephanie Jordan came to the elders uh, because she has a burden on her heart to intentionally disciple those in the community, uh, those who don't yet know Jesus. And so having received from training in the, some training in this before, she's prayerfully preparing a six-week group aiming to start it up after our evangelism series. And so when it comes to connecting with new people, the material points out that we often move from the simple to the serious to the spiritual. People don't automatically trust you. Like, you're not going to just show up and say, hey, uh, John 3.16, you should know it. And I'll be like, oh, got it. No, you have to kind of build up to that. Um, and so we start simply. We make everyday connections like professional wrestling uh, or Kentucky Wildcats or whatever the case may be, barbecue, basketball, chickens, whatever, whatever the case may be. Um, and so we see that as we move from the simple to the serious to the spiritual, uh, people are a little more willing to open if they realize, oh, this person actually cares about me as a human being and not as a sales pitch. And so as we conclude, um, when considering evangelism, some common questions are, how do you start the conversation? What about people who are hostile and don't want to talk? And how do we begin ministering to people of other religions or other worldviews? Well, we see the principles at Mars Hill addresses each of these. Well, how do you start a conversation? By getting to know someone looking for a common interest. By observing details about who they are and asking questions that aim to go deeper. For example, everybody and their mom has a cross tattoo these days. I bet what they think about that isn't what you think about that. Uh, and so I'd encourage you, if you see something like that, ask them, like, hey, the cross means a whole lot to me. What does that mean to you? Or if they have a silly little Buddha figurine in their, in their cubicle, you can be like, huh, tell me about that. 
Half the time, I don't know, just thought it looked neat. And, and so these are opportunities for you to, to kind of invite yourself into deeper conversations with people. And so considering just how lonely our world is, think that you have the opportunity uh, to give them time to talk about themselves. Uh, show them uh, that you, you care because they are hungry to talk about themselves. And so if people are hostile and don't want to talk, they're going to make that clear quickly. Uh, but if they sense that you care about them, it's, they're going to be willing to talk a lot more. Uh, you know that ultimately you don't really want to talk to a salesman for a very long time, but you're happy to talk to somebody who's happy to talk to you whether you're gonna, they're going to benefit from it or not. And so, and so when you talk to people, you are not selling them anything. You are, you are showing them the truth of God's word, and, and they are either going to accept that or not. And you are showing them that whether they reciprocate it or not, whether it serves you or not. And so you may not feel qualified. You might think you're, you're, you're not ready, but you are the one in your home. You are the one in your schools. You are the one in your workplace. You are the one that God has sent, whether it's to prepare a way or to collect the fruit of those who have gone before you. And so God has not sent you to do this alone. Remember what we heard even earlier. Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And so God is at work through you. I pray that you know that. And so you are the one who has been called by God to serve in those areas. And so if you think that God can raise a man from death to life, then certainly he can work through you in some of these different areas of your life. And so as we're focused on going and doing, we wanted to end each each message by turning our attention to what we're going to do this week in response to the message. You know, oftentimes we say, stand up, see ya, and then we forget kind of what we talked about for a week, and then we come back and do it again. Uh, we're trying to avoid that. And, and so something we want to give you the opportunity to do is take a phone or some write, something you can write on right now, um, and what we want you to do is think about something from the message that has stirred you to action. Uh, whether it's, hey, in listening to this, I know that guy at Kroger that I've been ignoring for months that I really should talk to. Uh, or, hey, I know there's this one thing I need to do. And so I want to encourage you to write down, either via text to yourself or on paper, I will blank. I will talk to so-and-so. I will do this. Something that has convicted you from the message. And so I'm actually going to give you a minute or so to do that. So go ahead, actually write it down. Uh, and then I'll have you stand up, and we will be dismissed in prayer. So go ahead. All right. If you haven't finished it yet, you can finish it after we pray. Go ahead and stand up. I'll pray, and then I challenge you to not only go and do what you just wrote down, but even maybe tell somebody next to you as you leave what it is you just wrote down. There's a challenge. So I'll go ahead and pray, and we'll be on our way. Heavenly Father, we give you praise for this day. Lord, we thank you that you certainly go before us. We thank you that you are king of all the earth. Um, and how awesome it is to hear how you have been living and active uh, through your word and uh, in different communities years and generations ago. Oh, Lord, we love you. And we pray that as we go forth from here, that we certainly would go and do, that we would be faithful to do what it is you've told us to do, and we would be confident knowing that you are in us, knowing that he who has overcome the world is in us. And so, Lord, we give you praise for that. We thank you. Lord, we love you. It's in your son's holy and precious name we pray. Amen. If you liked what you saw here, go ahead and click on that like button. And while you're at it, for more great content, go ahead and subscribe to our channel.